Hey Francis, how you doing, man? Doing well, Eric. Well, nice to meet you. Um, Likewise. So Chad nominated you, so <laughs> don't shoot the messenger. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I'll have to poke Chad a little for that. But, uh, no, it's, it's All right, so he, you know, let's pick up on where, where kind of he and I left off. And he, one of the things that he mentioned was find a shooting partner. He said yeah. that's what, that's one of the things that has helped him tremendously. And of course, that's where you come in. Yeah. Yeah, he so, and I, yeah, it's been a couple of years now, but three years and uh, we push each other quite a bit. So so how did you get started and how, do you, how did you meet Chad and, you know, how is it going and where are you planning on going after this? Ooh, big, a lot of questions. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, now, I'm just trying to see the trajectory. I'm trying to paint a picture. Yeah. So, um, you know, I've been shooting since I was a little kid, obviously, you know, dad and like a lot of people start, um, competitively though, really didn't pick up. I did shoot a really hot stint of F class, mainly just practice in Michigan. Um, but that was back in like 20, oh gosh, 13, 14, 15, somewhere in there for about six months. Didn't, didn't really fit my style though. So I ended up kind of putting aside competition for several years and end of 2018, I shot a match at, in Ohio that, pushed my limits, uh, called the sniper's challenge or something like sniper's challenge or something else, along those lines, um, with Tom Rayner. And it was, it was what I thought PRS was supposed to be. Um, and it was, uh, a lot of 10 to 12 round stages with 60 second part times, <laughs> so, which is a little short compared to what we have now. Yeah. Um, so I spent a lot of time training thinking this is really cool. I want to do this. And I trained to the 60 second part time. Well, Lo and behold, um, that's a lot faster than what you need. So I built a lot of good skills early on. Uh, and then 2019 was my first competitive year in PRS. So um, from that, had a great season there. I met Chad in my, I think, second match at uh, MTC there. So early 2019. And it just sort of snowballed. You know, at first he was a competitor. And we, while we pushed each other, it was a little bit, you know, sparring friendship. Uh -huh. And it became more of a friendship and less sparring, but more so to push each other because we both recognized early on, you know, I was winning a match, he would win a match. Another one of our buddies, Zach Barr would win a match. And we just realized that, you know, alone we were good, but being able to push each other, if I see something he's doing well, I need to learn how to do that or how to emulate it uh, and vice versa. If I, he sees something that I'm doing well, he tries to learn how to emulate it. And I think, the, the core of some of the best competitors in the world, whatever genre, it doesn't matter what sport, the, the best competitors spawn out of friendships that slowly force themselves to get to the next level, uh, sort of almost unwittingly. Uh, and a lot of good positives come out of it uh, from not only the skill sets you learn and being able to be open minded about what you do and how you present yourself you know, to the competition, but also being able to share those experiences of success, failure, ups, downs, that I want to quit to man on top of the world type moments without an outlet to share those with someone who can really understand that. I think it detracts from how far you can go in any sport or any uh, competitive venue. You know, that, that is very true. Uh, I've always, my entire time shooting F class, uh, I've always found somebody to shoot against, you know, and yep. uh, lately, it's a, it's a group of friends, but we're always shooting against each other, you know. And uh, it's it's a it's a strange thing, right? Because you're trying to beat them, and even if if you're way down on the on the leaderboard, but as long as you beat them or they beat you, right? That's really at some point what you focus on. So yeah. your entire mission becomes to beat that person, right? But you you want you want to beat that person, but you also want to beat you want that person to get really good because if you keep beating them and they keep advancing, then you keep advancing, right? Exactly. Um, and so you want them to get better so that you have a stronger nemesis, right? But at the same time, you can't let them quit because then you lose your drive, right? Right. Am I right? Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny, you know, I run 22 matches and, and watching newer shooters come up the ranks and I, seeing the same struggles that I remember going through. For instance, you know, you have a really great match and you follow it up with a really bad one. Um, the emotional roller coaster that I'm watching them go through, knowing exactly how it's going to play out. Oh, I want to quit the sport, followed by, 
yeah, I think I'm going to sell my gear, followed by, well, oh, I'm going to go and practice, to, hey, when's the next match? Let's go. <laughs> you really, it's, it's crazy to think that we are really, as a competitor and a friend to a competitor, you know, we are the ones responsible to keep the industry, to keep the sport growing. And really, it, it, it challenges, we challenge ourselves to challenge others to challenge ourselves. And the sport, all sports, I think we, we competitively, there's something we all yearn for deep down that's sort of to be one step better, whether it's to ourselves, against others, or against the world. You have to pick your level and continuously work towards that goal, whittle away at it little by little by little by little. And eventually, you know, you shoot for the stars, you hit the moon type approach. Um, eventually, you're going to get there. And I think that's where Chad and I sort of stumbled into that early on. Not really intentionally, to be fair. It was sort of just something where we were both innately competitive and uh, we had a lot of good viewpoints that were similar, but just dissimilar enough to stay on the same track and learn from each other. So, yeah, but I agree with you. Do you find that in a way, because you help each other and you, you know, you, like I said, you want your shooting partner or quote unquote nemesis to do better. Uh, but at the same time, when they win, do you do you find that it's like like you, you find satisfaction, almost like a victory of your own, just because you both work together? I think, and then some. Um, to be honest, you know, I, I rarely view. And I think this is maybe something that Chad and I have sort of developed, not just between us, but amongst how we view competition and all of the people that we shoot with. We, we view other success as the greatest stepping stone to our success. Because if, if Chad wins, and I mean, this happens, this happened like three or four times, well, I guess now five times his last season where it was onesie twosie between Chad and I, um, watching him win the AG cup, even though I won the two day match, he won the, uh, the day three elimination, the final, you know, $30,000 event by two shots. Well, actually by one shot on a, on a shoot off. Um, but you know, I knew I was right there. I knew I was close. I was, I, I almost, I'm going to be, I'm probably going to regret what I see on camera when uh, we get to the, the audio video portion of shooting USA's coverage, because I distinctly remember watching the plate twist. And I mean, I was already out of the bind. I was running towards it to just give him the biggest hug I could possibly give him. Same thing at K&M earlier this year, we had the same situation occur. The success that you can, you can feel so happy for others that you can envision yourself also being that happy and then being just as happy for you. And I'm going to, I guess, I mean, I'm kind of on a little upper level kind of cloud, like 30,000 foot approach. There's something in, in innately gratifying to have such strong relationships with fellow shooters and fellow competitors to know that it's not about you winning. It's about how well you can support them in their success. And that, I think that sort of mentally puts you in a different level um, with respect to what it means to succeed or fail. Um, and to see the challenges coming up right it, it's uh i don't know man i mean you you are putting it very well into words what what it it all means you know because it's it's it goes beyond shooting for yourself way beyond yes it does and uh you know the fact that so i always talk about software right it's it's the knowledge that you have to operate your hardware, which is your equipment and all that, right? But mm -hmm. to see Chad have as much success as he's having, I mean, you're, you're having a lot of success too, right? But to see him, for example, win, uh, number one, you're happy for him because you guys are working together. But at the same time, to know that he is winning with the same software <laughs> that you are mm -hmm. running on, uh, that solidifies, uh, I think, you just it just you just know for a fact well it just wasn't my time it's not that you don't have the skill level it just wasn't your time yep i think that's a perfect way to say it because it does validate all of the things that we train to it validates the systems that we put in place the decisions that we've made to you know ignore certain facets of shooting you know whether it's the micro details and reloading or whether it's I need to focus on this one piece of gear that's going to get me a point. Like there are so many ways we can get distracted in this sport specifically uh, that weed out the, the few minutes, which turns to hours, which turns to days of inactivity or, you know, call it a lack of um, lack of moving forward as a skill set. And what we've 
work towards, uh, both individually and together, is simply a the simplest possible system we can come up with to put rounds on target. And it is working. I mean, point in case, so we were rookies three years ago. Uh, my first year, I think, uh, ended up winning the regional championship, the Michigan championship, uh, all with the same you know sort of mindset. Where I am now versus where I was then, not even in the same league. It's just we continually progress. And I think you put it really well, you know, validating what he's seeing, what he's doing and winning. Uh, and also when I'm winning, he knows that I'm using a winning strategy. Therefore, if he's winning, I'm winning and vice versa. And then we both push each other towards the same goal ultimately. So it's going to happen a lot more in 2022. Good, good. Uh, you touched on, on keep, you know, keeping it simple, right? Uh, Man, I, uh, I'm glad you said it because I've said it many times and, and people, oftentimes they think simple is not good enough, right? And they try to go, they, they just try to do way too much, but there's no substitute for trigger time. Uh, you know, dry fire, um, do you dry fire a bunch? Yeah, I used to, I obviously did a lot more in my first year and second year. Now I really did, I don't have enough time to do it as religiously as I'd like, but coming up to a big match, absolutely. I'll, I'll spend 20, 30 minutes focusing on a few. Uh, oh, 20, 30 minutes. About, yeah, 30 minutes or so. So, you know, before an, any match, Pro Series, one day, I'll spend about 20, 30 minutes, about a week prior, dry firing on a very specific basic skill, you know, from just exhales. So bolt back, inhaling on the bolt to the rear, exhaling as slowly as I'm going forward, and I want to finish my exhale while I'm acquiring the target and ready to set. That's all I do for about 20, 30 minutes. And it's just to kind of get back into the basic fundamental mode. What does it take to keep the reticle dead still on target? Exhale, press, see where the reticle is. That's it. Uh, beyond that, that's about all I do for dry fire these days. So Yeah. What did you do before? When before you were I first spent year? a lot of time, you know, my first season working on bag placements, and then like, call it the micro step. So first it was just the mechanics. What do I have to do to get around at the target? I need dope. So practice a system to put my dope somewhere that was easy. I started with an arm board. I didn't like the placement of that after a few months. I noticed it's it's a moving target, so to speak. And it's down low, then it's up. Yeah, I think I know what the problem was. There was a, it said Zoom has an update right after I uh, closed it. I'm like, of course it does. Oh, of course. And it said fixes some bugs and freezes and other fun <laughs> stuff. So I'm going to switch over to this. This is on just Wi-Fi uh, via my phone, or so it should be pretty stable. But uh, okay. we will we'll see. This isn't normally an issue around us. So it's interesting. Well, we're talking about uh, guns, how's, so. how's the audio sound so far? All right. So far, so, so far is good. All right. Uh, the only thing I know it's a little bit of pain with this is my phone likes to go in and out of focus a little. So I have to work like crazy to not, uh, to not move around too much. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so. Okay, so you had uh, you arm the yeah. It was a yeah, moving so charge. Early on, you know, I, I tried a lot of different things. But early on, the main focus was learning how to move quickly and efficiently. So it went from just basics, dialing dope. How do you manipulate a stage, finding targets, and understanding the, the game of PRS? Uh -huh. Then it progressed from there to how to be more efficient while running the game of PRS. Where were my footfalls? Was I taking two steps with a baby half shuffle to get from position A to position B on a barricade? Or was it one step? I'm already My right foot's planted, and now my left foot just comes into the right position. Am I already in the same position without having to move forward into the right all the little details that you I mean you're well aware of when it comes to PRS and really any sport that involves shooting, you have to be in a specific spot to make the rifle act consistently. And learning to make those things more consistent um, translated to being able to change the, the focus of my sport, my game into, so basics are handled. I know how to operate a stage. I know how to move around very efficiently and very quickly. I can spend more time now doing other things. Reading wind, reading condition, watching for splash, looking for mirage changes, vegetation, um, solving problems on the fly, like mag failures or feeding failures. So, you know, the, the, the pyramid, as, as I would call it, you know, start at the base and work your way to the top. And right now, you know, I'm, I'm literally working at the very tippy top, trying to shave, you know, a quarter to it. I want to add a quarter to a tenth of a point per stage. 
that's what we're fighting against in order to win matches. It's one, two, three points maximum to win a match. So. Right. And obviously when you started, right, it, it became real easy to shave five points or 10 points from the <laughs> yeah. match. And now you're trying to shave one or two and it's, it's, it's really hard because you are very efficient. And now you're just trying to become more efficient, which there's a lot less room there. Yeah, there's. I mean, it's crazy to look at what the best shooters do now versus, and even just three years ago, what the best shooters were doing in three years ago. Mm -hmm. But the the razor's edge line that we've all began to walk, you know, to hit targets consistently and get you know 85, 90, 95, even 96 plus percent of a course of fire. There is no room for error. Uh, I think it's you know in one sense PRS is is moving towards some of the other professional sports where you know like F class. You know, F-class, you know, 600, 800 yard matches, you know, correct me where I'm wrong, but, you know, a lot of those are dominated in like the 199 year of fast second. Like it's, just, it's pretty easy to be a 199 second, like a 500 yard, 600 yards F-class. Um, can't drop any. Whereas, you know, you put one or two out of the 10 ring um, at a thousand yards, you might be in the top few places. But that's sort of the same game that we're starting to get to. The equipment's good enough. The rifles are good enough. The targets are... Uh, relatively, they're not small, they're not large, they're starting to move towards the smaller side. But generally speaking, the competitors are really good. We have no room for error. So it is now manipulation of the smallest details. It's it's starting to follow the same trend that F-Class did. F-Class used to have a 2 MOA target. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the 10 ring used to be 2 MOA. And then everybody got really good and they're like, well, we're just going to cut it in half. And then they went to 1 MOA. And it's still one on my eight, and there's already conversation about, hey, you know, we should shrink it because everybody's shooting clean now. Uh, but uh, you know, like I said, I see the same trajectory for for PRS of shrinking yeah. the targets across the board because everybody, and, and it's 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 a typical uh, trajectory that sports follow when they become popular and people really want to win and they they get better and better and ever, you know, they get better. And then the the next person has to get better, and everybody gets better. And then, you know, at some point, everybody starts shooting perfect scores, right? So they yeah. have to find a way to 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 uh, maintain the separation. So yeah. you know, I don't think it's going to be very very long before you know. Uh, you said it's already happening where the the targets are getting smaller, but. Yeah. I, I bet you it won't be long where you won't see a single two MOA target anywhere. Yeah, yeah, I, I think a pro match is for sure. AG Cup and pro matches, I think it will be. The trend is moving more towards one and a half to maybe two MOA on a larger target. The AG Cup was a really good example of that. We shot an average of, I think, 1.2 MOA targets, you know, to 1,100 yards. Yeah. Those are incredibly small. And, and we had several one MOA targets from positions. Yeah, in in ten shot stages, and that's that's pushing limits, and it's not a bad limit because watching top level competitors come off of stages sweating means, like we talked about earlier, we all just found a new limit. Okay, let's work to find that new limit, and we're all going to continue to push it forward just little by little by little. And I love that. I mean, that is if we're not growing, we're failing, and if we're if we're constantly taking a step forward to be better with ourselves every single day, you know, own it every day. Uh, there's nothing else we can ask for in this in this life. So, so in F class, uh, when I started shooting over a decade ago, the uh, at a thousand yards, the record was a 199, 15 X's. Okay. Uh, then, in I don't know when it happened, uh, 2010 or some somewhere along those lines, maybe 2008, nine. Uh, Charles Ballard shot a clean with 30 nexus and everybody's like holy smokes like that is an incredible record well not not long after that danny biggs breaks it again 215. yeah and then danny biggs did it twice uh did it one day and then did it the next day he did it one day in the calm and then the next day in the wind and everybody's like holy crap then along comes david gosnell and then he shoots a 217 he did it twice and and then at that point it's like wow that's only three x's shy of 
20, which would be the absolute per, uh, perfect, right? Yeah. And this is 17 shots at a thousand yards on a half MOA target, right? Yeah, it's tiny. <laughs> and uh, so Larry Tate and I used to joke and said, you know, if we ever shoot 20 X's, just leave the gear there. Y'all can have it. I'm done. You know what I mean? It's because that, yeah. that is so unobtainable, right? It's just crazy to think that somebody can shoot 20 shots and half MOA at a thousand yards. Fast forward, uh, and see, nobody could break the 17 barrier. That just seemed to finally, like, okay, we're finally there. Well, then yeah. Norm Harold one day lays down and shoots 22 X's. He shot the 20 plus two more. And now, ever since, there's been a lot of 18 and 19 X shot. After, you know, the 17 seemed to be the limit until the 22 was shot. And now they 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 went past the 17 like like no problem, but it's it's I think it's a self-imposed barrier that that exactly. we 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 uh, established right, and now the norm shot 22 X's, there's been 19 X's 18s like the norm you know like now and they mean nothing now, <laughs> which is right. I, I think the 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 pressure isn't there when the shooters are shooting. And they get 17, 18, 19. They're like, well, it doesn't matter, right? Because whereas before, once you start approaching that 16 X's, 17, 17 was the record, the, the pressure level just builds like crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's it. I think you said, you know, the psychological limit we impose. I think that's a really, a very insightful way to think about it your career not even just shooting career any sport you play or anything you do in life most of the limits that we find are self-imposed whether or not we really want to internalize that and say yeah it's me well, eventually it is you and you is the faster you can accept that you're the self you're the limit whether it's you're not willing to get up one hour earlier it's to practice something or whether it's it's just too hard those self-imposed limits are there and they're always a product that we can work X amount harder. And I think there are some, some couple people have said it, but I can't remember. I'll attribute it to who, whoever said it. It wasn't me. Um, <laughs> you know, the, those who succeed are going to be the ones who are willing to go where everyone else will, right? It, being able to do one more step and push another limit and find a new, new level and a new gear is what defines how we set, we set our new benchmark. So when someone's chasing a 15 X or they're chasing a 90% or you know, a clean stage or nine out of 10 clean stages in one day of a PRS match. And then same thing day two, we're redefining that internally. Every time we see the, the new record holder or the new competitor, that's our new goal. Uh, and to the ones who have the drive, the passion, to the, the will, the stamina to get to that level, that's what their, their new limits is. You know, Tiger Woods, when he came on board, I was in the golf industry for a long time. Um, and when Tiger Woods came on, he was, Dominable. I mean, like there was just literally no one who could touch him. He was dominating the field across every match, every single event, and I, it was almost humbling to watch what happened to the competitors around him because they would disintegrate as soon as they had to pair up with him on Sunday. And it, because Tiger wasn't competing against his against the competitor or the other fellow golfers, he was competing against himself. Uh, and there, since then, you know, then as soon as Tiger happens. It spawns a bunch of other super athletes within the sport of golf, you know, between Rory McIlroy uh, and, and several others, but Jason Days. Me, all of these guys then set, you know, new levels of what it means to be the best of the world. And that all starts with one person. So if, you know, I would say anybody out there who's watching this, if you, if you think that you can be the best, you can be. It's just going to take the time, the effort, the energy, and a lot of sacrifices that you may not even recognize what they'll be right now, but there will be sacrifices you'll have to make, but you can get there. And if you believe it strongly enough, you can at least continuously work towards getting. There. So I agree with you. 100%. Yeah. I think the other problem that, that we have is we may set a goal, which seems unobtainable, but then once you start putting in the work, you realize, oh, I shot a little too short. And then you meet that goal and then you have no idea what to do after that. Uh, which is in uh, Lanny Basham in his book, Win Winning in Mind, he talks about 
have a moving target of a goal, right? That you can keep moving because if you have a hard goal, oftentimes you don't realize it, but it may be too short of a goal, which then what? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The where do you go after this type of approach? Um, you know, that's something that Chad and I, again, going back to the initial discussion on why I have a partner, a friend, someone that you can bounce these ideas and goals off of, you know, having someone who's saying, I'm setting my goal here. You're not going to set your goal behind them in all likelihood. You're going to set it at least as high as them. Right. And then you're probably going to go, yeah, well, that's cool, but I'm going to set it. <laughs> with, you're going to clean one match. Cool. I'm going to clean four. Right. And then you're going to clean four. Cool. I'm going to go win the AG cup championship. Like <laughs> that's the type of goal. And then, Hey, we're just going to go win the world. Like it doesn't matter. I'm going to, you know, backhand right. blindfolded win a PRS match. Right. <laughs> Those types of friendships and are all of those things, you know, between setting goals, finding people to help you be accountable for your goals, and then working towards them continuously, you are now, you have a way to sort of reset your litmus every time you have a conversation with the, the friend who says, oh, I'm almost to this, or I just had the great step towards my goal. And then you'll quickly realize that he's getting there really quick. I have to be able to do the same. You'll then be able to say, I'm going to set my goal forward. Hey, I'm not going to just do one. I achieved that. Let's set a new goal early. Yeah, um, which is obviously very important. But also, uh, whenever you feel like you can't reach it, then you can talk to to them, whoever your partner, your shooting partner is, and they'll be like, man, you can do this. It's fine. And then they, they help you. They kind of pull you up, right? Yeah. And then And then you get a little more... You get a little wind under your sails or whatever whatever that saying is but uh yeah. and then they they pull you up right and and then you start pushing forward and then you start to get some traction and you may pass them up right they kind of slink shoot you to the front and then they may be in that situation and then you guys just kind of uh pull each other up to the front right yeah, that's, I think NASCAR works that way. You know, yeah. draft a leader, yeah, slingshot through to the finish line. Um, that is very Shake and bake. Shake, yeah, and shake and bake. Shake and bake. Yeah, we jokingly, we, we do. He loves Will Ferrell movies, and we always, <laughs> when we go to hotel, we're watching either Will Ferrell or some other comedy, and yeah. Shake and Bake has been tossed around more uh, than once yeah, at, I uh, in the car ride. So. so, you talk about practicing really hard early on, and I talk about software. Obviously, you don't have this software. Where where do you go for knowledge when you're starting on, when you're first starting out? Or do you just say, you know what, this is what needs to be done, and then you come up with your own, uh, let's call it program, to get better? So, this is, a, honestly, this feels a little difficult to answer because I feel like when I started, I I thought I knew what I wanted. This, and you're probably familiar with the Dunning-Kruger effect and all of that. And I think this is part of the recognizing how to get from A to B in, in a successful sport or anything you're going to learn. As you're new, you know this much. And as soon as you learn one millimeter more, you feel like you just learned this much, right? And it's, I will say early on, I felt like I knew everything that had to be done. I could do it right. I could do it better. I could do it faster. And then I learned really quickly, well, yeah, that's true. It's successful. But then Chad starts catching up to me. And I'm like, why am I not pulling away from him? Because it feels like I'm doing more than I should have. And lo and behold, you know, we learned personally. When I first started, I learned from those around me very quickly, absorbed as much as I could. And then it had to translate from, I can't learn from them because their goals are not the same as mine. And I think anybody who's done anything at a high level or tried to compete at a high level realizes you know, at different levels within any given sport, you have some people are content just being there. Other people are content, you know, being there and winning or being a top five in, say, a little one-day match. That's not where I wanted to be. So when the competitors in my small pond were content, I wasn't and I had to jump to a bigger pond. So I think to answer the question kind of a roundabout way, I started with what made sense to my body, my movement, my basic format of thinking, which was feel, go fast and send it. I mean, that was essentially it. Like, if you watched me shoot early on, I looked like a fast-moving wrecking ball. Um, but then I slowly learned I know where my new challenges are. And it's not timing out. It's seeing a miss. 
Okay, it's following through. It now becomes other details. And I, I learned that by jumping into a bigger pond. So instead of being in this little one-day pond, I jumped into the two-day pond, which means I'm watching 10 shooters who are all as good or, in fact, 10 times better than me when I first started. And just watching what they're doing, I was then became, you know, learning to mimic. And mimicry, once you practice it enough, you'll start to recognize what works for you and you can fine tune that small that small skill set of placing a bag. Like for instance, a uh, medium, I run Armageddon gear bags and you know, most people will put it in the bag, it's not a medium, it's a full size game changer. Most people will run a bag this way on a barricade, right? There's the big flap. They'll put it down on some object and they set the rifle on the tippy top. Well, depending on the obstacle, that's what I knew and I didn't know there was anything different. So I'd go home and I'd experiment with every possible position and orientation that this bag has. And I found the best orientation for me, at least at the time, was I used the points of the bag, you know, to my support, my left hand, my off hand, so that I could grab this small point and st help stabilize the front of the rifle to raise elevation. So now I start a transition from being, quote, what I knew to something new by just being able to control elevation. And that wasn't something that anybody taught me. I just had to go experiment. I knew that the right gear was in front of me from other people. What I didn't know was how to make this gear work to my advantage every time for my skill set. And then from there, it was fine tuning. Okay, well, I like this, but this bag is too big. Let's go to a pint size. Okay, that's too small. Let's go to a different one. Got that. Okay, now it's good and it's in the right place. Where do I need to place my hand on the rifle? And how much pressure do I use? I, I, I would fine tune all the way down on one thing until that, you know, sort of mile long hole was this is the end. There's nothing more to be gained out of this thing. And from there, I would gain a couple of points of stage. Mm -hmm. But but how awesome is that when, when it actually works, right? Oh, that's cool. <laughs> it's, it's way cool. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah, I think Chad... Chad has some really cool moments where, like, I, I give Chad a lot of credit because when he started, he was a little bit slow. He'll, he won't, he wouldn't deny that. So if you were here, he would agree with me. He was a little on the slow side because he's very methodical. I was, you know, the speed demon, run like hell, and finish the stage with 40 seconds left. No point there. But we sort of worked to the, to the middle, and then we crossed paths. I became a little too slow. He became a little faster. Um, but yeah, when you, I had an issue where, and he did too in the same match where my mag malfunctioned, malfunctioned. He had practiced mag malfunctions and knew exactly how to clear it. I never expected to have a mag malfunction because one, I've never had one on the clock. I've never thought about it. And the match is just going awesome. And I'm cleaning this stage. And then right. I short stroke one, mag bumps it, go to the next one, wham. And now I'm, you know, two in the pipe. And then I remember going, what is going on? And I just kept, just, yeah, just driving, just shove it harder, forward. right? And I'm like, it's not going. And then your brain explodes with adrenaline. It explodes with endorphins, and you can't help but just feel your face get red. Your blood pressure spikes. You lose all sense of time. You don't even remember what target you're on. You didn't dial your dope, and all of the cascade failures that occur happen all at once. You start to fix it, and before you know it, it's like, time. <laughs> From that yeah. point forward. You know, I'm immediately to, you know, what you're saying about how great is it when it works? Well, that cost me, you know, a top three in a, my first, well, not my first pro match, but one of the pro matches down at Southington my first year. And I went home and I would just double stuff, boom, rip the mag, start a new one. Got it. Learn how to clear the, clear the malfunction. Just keep going. Now, if I feel any resistance, boom, out comes the mag, in goes a new one, ready to go. It's two seconds. Yeah. And I don't think twice about it. So to your point, it feels amazing to have something you have practiced show up and go, I got this. And not yeah. even think twice. Well, because, yeah, you don't even come. think, you, I got this. You just know what to do. You just do it. Yeah. And it's. To, I think the cool part is watching. And I mean, personally, it's fun. It's more fun to watch someone doing something unexpected on the clock to solve a problem. The way they approach it and how smooth it looks, like, as, as competitive shooters know, like you know right away when you see something going wrong on a stage and how gracefully they can fix that 
is honestly the sign of what makes a good shooter a great shooter. Because so, so it's, it's, it's difference. I have a story about that. So when I started, yeah. uh, like, you know, I'm going to play around with PRS because I had some friends and like, you got to try it. I'm like, all right, I'll try it. Well, of course, they kept talking about how F-class shooters are slow, right? So I'm already compensating for this. So I'm like, I'm going to go really fast, right? Yeah. And that was the thing. It's like, I don't care if I hit it as long as I go fast because that was a win for me, right? Well, which was stupid, right? Because I'd miss everything pretty much. But anyway, uh, I go to a two-day match. And I'm watching somebody go. I mean, I mean, this guy's moving like like I would move, like just crazy everywhere. And I'm like, oh, man, this guy's fast. You know what I mean? Yeah. And bam, yeah. he times out. And I'm like, wow, I'm never going to make it. I mean, this guy was so fast and he timed out, right? And then I see somebody else, one of the good shooters, and he's just going. And I'm like, this guy's never going to make it. And he just seems like, like he was so slow. In my eyes, it looked yeah. so slow. But he was making movements with purpose. And cleans the stage, never times out. And I'm mind blown because I'm like, the guy that looks so fast timed out. And the guy, I kept thinking the whole time, he's going to time out. He's going to time out. He's going to time out. Well, mm -hmm. the difference was the guy that was, he wasn't fast. He was just moving fast, right? But he was taking forever to get on the scope. And he's, he's, he can't find the target. But he was doing everything really fast where the other guy was put the rifle down, get on there, and let it go. But it seemed slow, but it was perfectly executioned. And that's when I realized, oh, these guys are efficient. The, you know, th that's what makes them fast, right? And like you said, I, I saw somebody have a, a, a failure. You can't really call it a failure. Had it been me, it would have been a failure. But him, he just dropped the Mac, put another one in, and just kept going. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I, it's I impressive to watch. It is. And, you know, the, the slow is fast and the fast, smooth is smooth is fast and fast is fast, whatever that saying is. Yeah. It really applied. Um, and it's really speaking to what you said, efficiency. And that's where early on when I started working towards efficiency, I found it was it was helpful. It wasn't helpful because I was in quicker. I was just going faster. It was helpful because it gave me more time to process events, whether it's processing where you hit on a target whether it's processing a miss, whether it's trying to understand why you didn't see your miss and trying to make an educated guess as to where to go next. All of those little mental stacks, you know, if you have a, let's say a split time of six seconds between shot break to break, well, that's pretty slow by PRS standards. Um, if your transition time is 10 seconds and it's six seconds to break a shot plus another six seconds, you're talking close to 22 seconds per, you're going to be Per six, uh, a little over a minute, what is that, 80, 60 seconds, 68, almost 70 seconds. What's my math there? I can't even, 20 uh, seconds, five would be uh, 100 seconds. 100. Yeah, you're so you're going to be over time, even with any, uh, with any sort of lack of efficiency, you're going to be over time, even though you might feel like you're moving really quickly. So let's say you, you cut a transition time to four seconds to place a bag on target within three. Hit the target, hit the target in two seconds. And you can, if you can say sub 10, well, you're still, now you're too fast. That's a 60 second stage, even on, you know, a six target stage with double taps. Finding a balance point in how fast to go is really difficult. But a lot of it starts with just being efficient and where you place a bag, understanding what is a cadence that gets me sub par time and a cadence that gets me at par time versus over par time. Um, that is probably one of the more difficult challenges because I think everybody's internal clock is a little different. You know, if you're used to being slow or feeling super comfortable, got to see the crosshair dead still. I think that's the bane of a lot of new shooters. They try to make a crosshair immeasurably motionless. And that doesn't happen. And if we don't have enough time to do that consistently. And we don't really need to. I mean, our targets are pretty big. Um, but I think if we continue to transition that to being as stable as you can define it for you in, say, two to three seconds, now your, tra your training goal, if you can say, well, I was sort of getting the crosshair stable in three seconds. Let me get it stable in two seconds. And now dry fire to get it stable in one second. And now can I stabilize it in 
half a second. And now can I stabilize it literally be on target as I'm coming into the gun? Am I on target? Uh, and that's actually something I still train. You know, when I get time, one of the training drills I have is placing the gun and being within uh, half a mil, like from center across here. I want to be half a mil left, right, up, down of the target, just setting the rifle down blind. If I can do that, I've had a successful day. And that just works to the sort of hand-eye coordination that's required to get to your target. And a lot of people would ask, well, what good is that? Well, the good is I'm not going to search for targets because I know my gun is pointed to the target I want. Two, if I'm, I can get good enough to place it left or right, man, you watch Nick Gadarzy shoot? It is Nick, like, Nick, Nick Gadarzy, Jake Millard, Dave Preston, um, Ken Sanoski at times, uh, and some of the, a couple other guys, John Pinch is kind of like that. Vibbert's like that. It's just like watching molasses happen. It just slowly comes out of the bottle before you know it. There's a huge flop. Those guys run so smooth and so efficiently. It's because they've learned all of the steps along the way. You know, and I hope to say that I probably look similar to that now. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't like that at the start. Yeah, so. yeah. I think it was Matt Brousseau who I saw. Oh, uh, Matt Tug. And That's I was thinking, oh, this is going to time out. You know? Kind of time out, Matty B. Yeah, yeah, and he just ran right through it. Uh, so the other thing that it does, if you can set your gun down and almost be on target, you don't have to muscle it and get it out of, you know, the natural point of aim, right? It's, it's already established, right? And now you just get be if 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 you can set it down and be on target, pretty much, that means everything's already aligned. You just Manipulate it slightly and, like you said, sand it. Uh, th that that would save you so much time. Yeah, you know? and then you can spend it on exhales and proper bolt manipulation, follow through, you know, being certain you dialed the right number, not almost the right number. Talk using the right rhetoric. Talking yeah, smack talk to your smack friends. Because, like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, you know that, that's that's one thing I've seen in mean, the shooting whale. They, they, they're they shooting and they're talking smack and they're just, it's, you know, obviously at a club match or something. But it's it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. You get to have, it's when you're relaxed, when you're shooting targets, everything just a yeah. lot more fun, right? And it goes to that sort of flow state, right? We I work a lot to try to find what a lot of sports psychologists would call flow. Right? You're trying to get into a zone where you're not thinking about what you're doing, you're executing, and you're almost looking kind of third person at yourself executing on whatever skill you're trying to accomplish or whatever goal. Is. So uh, whether it's setting the rifle down, you already it's almost like you know what's about to occur before it ever happens, and you're just like, yeah, the bag is going to hit this seam, and the target's going to be two-tenths right of center in my reticle, and you look through the scope, and there it is, and I'm going to send the shot. Yep, it's going to hit the upper left center by one inch, and I'm going to have I'm perfectly centered, but I'm going to come down a half of a tenth low and right. It's hard to describe to someone who hasn't been in that moment, but we all have it. We just have it either very short amounts or, you know, occasionally really long amounts, like the entirety to win a match. Uh, there's no surprises. There's that? just no, there's no surprises. There's, That's what you get. Yeah. It's, it's, everything is expected. Everything happens. Everything's smooth. Everything is uh, just flows, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's a hard state to maintain, but it is arguably the coolest drug that anybody can experience in, in competition. You, you get done, you look back and realize, wait, that's it? Okay. Um, it, you know, when, cool. when, when the crazy thing, right, is when, when you shoot your best, sometimes people talk about how tough it was, and you're like, no, it wasn't. It wasn't that hard. And uh, um, it, it's just that you were in in the zone. You could see it all. Everything was clicking. And they weren't, right? And the best part is when you're the only one in that state. Because you yeah. just plow through the whole competition. And you just leave everybody in the dust. And, and they talk about how hard it was. And it's it's incredible. It's a, it's a, But yeah. like you said, if you can manage to do that, quite often the problem is others will see that and like huh, if he can do it i can do it and then they you know and back to what we discussed earlier then yeah. everybody gets better and which you know not a bad thing no and i mean to your point but i think this is actually one of the one of the big leaping off points in my shooting career 
stuff. Actually, really anything I've done competitively, how you frame your outlook. Golf, I was, again, the golf industry is near and dear to me. Uh, you know, I think you might see it here. PGA placard back there, but a lot of shooters will talk about, and I think Lanny talks about this, you know, talking about what you did poorly, how hard something is, talking about how difficult this was, how, oh, that, that stage was too hard, the targets are too small, how you mentally position all of those small details also positions how you're going to succeed on a macro level. You know, if I'm telling myself it's the hardest match with the hardest targets and the worst win with worst props in the history of worst, yeah, it's going to be probably the worst performance. I'll have, I'll feel like I owe it a bad performance. However, if it's a good prop and a learning opportunity with a really cool position that I've never shot from at a, in a series of motions that I've never tried and I'm excited to try, everything is potentially a success because now I, I have this sort of optimistic, ooh, I'm excited to give this a run. That small difference, when I hear competitors you know, off to the side saying, oh, that this or that, like mentally, boom, I check out, like instantly check out. As soon as I hear negativity about how hard something was, how poorly they did, how switchy the winds were, all of that is completely irrelevant because we're all doing the exact same thing. And I know in golf, it's very much the same way. You know, we, if you ask somebody, oh, oh how'd, how'd your round go? Oh, I mean, I had a double, I was shot pretty well, but I had double bogey on instantly. Yeah. You're focusing on the negative. And I think we would all go a lot further in our careers if you can learn to tune out the negative side of what you did, just like Lanny talks about, and really focus on seeing the, the entirety of a match, the entirety of your practice as a bunch of small learning opportunities that you're happy to be there to partake in. Right. That's a huge value value add that it just lets you position all of the small, you know, hurdles in in each match or each practice, to make them more successful. Yeah, I uh, in F class, I man, I love the wind. Yeah, I love the wind. It, it and it's not that I'm a master at it. It's just I love it. I you know if if I get my ass kicked, so be it. I just love shooting in it. You know. And I think because of that excitement, I oftentimes uh, do really well, you know, and I'll win matches when it's really windy just because I'm not afraid of it. You know, I'm excited to be there where most people are just tense. They don't, they don't want to pull the trigger. And, and, and I'm like, well, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. But I want to shoot in this stuff, you know. Yeah. And I've had some of my worst scores ever have been in that win. But guess what? Oh well, you know what I mean. It's it's it was fun and I enjoy it. But uh, when it's windy, it knocks out the majority of the competition because they're just yeah. afraid. Yeah, that's you know that's something I actually really want to learn more about. Not F class per se, but in the idea of fear, because I think fear as a motivator is a lot of people will think fear is a motivator. Well, fear isn't necessarily a motivator. It can be a almost put you in a catatonic state. I think Formula One racers, um, motorcycle racers, and other people who put adrenaline, like literally risking their lives just to go cross a finish line, I think there's a lot of psychology that you can learn from that. And I, I really want to go find some, I've seen a couple of books that I'm looking at reading uh, about the, the philosophy mindset and sort of the, what it takes to perform at like say Formula One racing or NASCAR, because I mean, it's literally lethal if you make a mistake at certain points. And you know that they're not thinking, don't crash, don't crash, don't crash. No. They're thinking, get, you know, oh, I need to go two inches to the inside of this guy's bumper. Uh, and then on the next turn, you know, like Formula One, two turns later, I'll be in a good position because he was a foot too far left on turn two. So turn five, I got him. Right. That sort of chest mode approach is something that I, I really am intrigued by. I used to race motorcycles at track days way back when in post-college and high school. And... I remember that feeling of watching really, really good racers and just not understanding how they were doing what they were doing. And that is, I think, a lot of it. They're not focused. I was focused on don't crash. And yeah. I and did. Yeah. I crashed. Yeah, and I had several. Yeah. But if you focus on the next turn and the next apex and then knowing that this apex leads to that, leads to that, leads to that, that sort of roadmap of being able to get in and out of turns, I think these, we can apply the same concept to how we approach matches or practice uh, and how we want to succeed in the sport as well. 
So I started shooting pool to prepare for shooting. Uh, and pool, most people shoot balls in, in pockets. But when you really learn how to shoot pool, you have to know everything. Like if you're shooting eight ball, you look at the whole thing and then you go, I'm going to do this. And, and then you see the whole pattern, right? right? And then you'll see professional pool players. They'll make the ball and they're like, they're just scratching their head. Like, what did I just do? Right. And you're, yeah. and, and, and somebody who doesn't understand pool, they're like, he made it. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that he landed an inch to the left or to the right and three shots later he's a, he's got a problem because of that yeah. right exactly. and now he needs to compensate and compensate and compensate and if if he can't get back in line they call it getting back in line he's going to be in trouble right and yeah. uh, i started learning how to shoot pool and watching a lot of pro players shoot pool and it's incredible how every shot they if they get what they call out of line, they they don't try to get back in line in one shot. They the next shot they get a little bit closer, a little bit closer, and two or three shots later they're back in line and then they just run the table. But it's yeah. uh it's incredible how how that works and how like I said, the really good pool players, they don't panic at at the when they're out of line. But they just start working their way to being back in line, yeah. and uh, I think that is very important in in any sport uh, to see the full picture, right? Right. Yeah, I mean, to the billiard side, I played in college, and uh, I, I actually just recently watched an Efren Reyes match. It was one of his first matches. I can't remember who he was playing, but just he missed a shot that quite literally put him in a position to really he only had a safety or. He could like, if he if he made the shot, he might. He had like a ten, like five, ten percent chance to set the cue ball back on. I think it was the seven. He was playing obviously nine ball, and he's like, I think I can make this. And instead of playing the safety that you saw, he makes the shot, and then he has to make another hard shot, followed by another hard shot, followed by like the worst nine ball position you could have, sort of center table cross side, and uh -huh. he made it. And I'm just going, this is incredible to watch, and I I've, I love pool because pool is sort of the the moving chess game that's always infinitely different and you have to adapt i think our shooting sports are much the same way you know when we have a mistake and we think i just bombed the stage i'm done that is the same thing as getting out of line sort of the pool right you think you're done and then you just ah, oh, i'm good or okay i have to clean the next stage that's your first thought i'm just going to clean the next blank stages and get right back well that's sort of the same concept of trying to bite off too much, you know, too much English and too much draw to get into the same position you should have been in. You can't do that. You have to stack it and it just say, I'm going to focus on making one less mistake. So, so, so by being successful. But, but then again, right? If Efren had never gotten out of line, he would just have played what appeared to be boring and never looked great, right? So, right. You have to think about that. It, it, it's, 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 and, and the only reason you saw that video or people are showing it is because of those amazing shots that he came up with. But he only did that because he made a mistake. He didn't right. play perfect, which caused him to shoot these amazing shots, right? So keep that in mind. If you make a mistake, you fall behind, all of a sudden you have a chance for greatness, right? That's, I think that's exactly it. Yeah. You, one mistake, like you said, you know, one mistake doesn't mean you you don't you're out of it. It means you now have a you have a practice moment to learn how to be the best you could have ever been without that practice moment. Right. Um, I, I think that's the great way to say it. Yeah, it's it's incredible. Um, but so you know, that's what I did, and and I learned a lot about being in the moment. Don't don't try to get back in line in one shot. Just gradually get back in line, and. Uh, and then the pressure, you know, I was, I was under pressure. I joined the league and I was under pressure once a week playing yeah. tournaments, which, which that, you know, learning how to deal with all that pressure, uh, is something that most people really, I think everybody needs to work on because that pressure I, I, builds. I 100% agree with that. Yeah. And I think that it's not only just the pressure, but it's what you do in reaction to the pressure. And this is kind of multi layer not what you think you're seeing. Like, am I failing or am I succeeding? Not that reaction. 
if I had a bad stage, do you immediately go be social with people and try to laugh? Or how, how are you dealing with it outside of, like, psycho psychologically speaking, you know, are you laughing at yourself really inside and then also going to have fun with other people and laughing with them and sort of defocusing because you're out of it, quote unquote. So now you defocus and you start just hanging with the guys. Well, maybe. I mean, if you're there to have fun in the first place and that was why you went to that match, maybe. But if you were trying to succeed when you started, you fast forward, you make a mistake, and then you go into, say, play mode. That's seeming, that's the wrong approach, in my opinion. I mean, you, just because you had a mistake and just because you may have not be exactly perfect doesn't mean you're not going to learn and execute as best as you possibly can. What uh, happens is they, they abort yeah, the mission. Right. They abort the mission, right? Yeah. <laughs> Bail out. Pull the yeah. eject. And, uh, yeah. and back to that Efren example, right? To abort the mission, he could have just played safe and that's it, right? Yeah. But instead, he, he decided that, no, the mission is to clean this and I'm just going to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And uh, I tell you what, those, that's when I've seen moments of greatness, like I talked about Efren, right? Because, for example, somebody, let's say they tank a stage. And instead of saying, well, I'm out of it. Hey, y'all you want me to be your win bitch? I'll be your win bitch. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Instead of saying that, if they just say, okay, that's fine. Just keep going. What did I do good on that one stage? Well, I didn't time out. I, I shot the correct course of fire. Okay, that's fine. Let's build on that and keep going. And, and if they keep going and they just absolutely burn it out the rest of the way, they're, they're like, okay, got it. Next time, I'll just do that. And if I don't have that train wreck, which I won't have, right? Because you got to build that. And all of a sudden, they're winning matches. Whereas if they find an excuse, it's it's going to be real easy to find an excuse next time. Yeah, that's exactly it. You know, PRS is not a sport that gives you, call it, 100% success all the time. It's giving you an excuse on every single trigger pull. Uh, every single time. There's always something you can say, ah, oh, that was not what I thought it was supposed to be. Walk away. It's 200 walk away moments every time you pull, every time you go to a two day. Um, right. I, I think the, the value add of learning to control how you react to stress and not just like, is it, are you angry? Are you sad? Are you disappointed? I mean, really all of the things that you notice you do when you're having great stages versus a poor stage, what do you do immediately after that? Because I think that if, if it doesn't go well, then Let's back up and say, what in your process? If it doesn't go well on the next stage, and then the next stage, and the next stage, they're all cascade failures. Somewhere early on in that cascade failure, you had the point to change something and get back on track. Unless you're, I mean, unless it's truly your gun goes down. Even then, if your gun goes down, you could have thought to bring a backup rifle and have it sighted in zero with ammo ready to go. Or if it's your scope that fails, your backup scope is in the car and you lose one stage, but you don't lose the entire match. Like Those small details matter in the long run because it's how you are going to react to anything that comes up as a struggle. And if you have the ability to sort of look through to the future, I know I'm going to do well in all of these areas. But hey, guess what? I haven't, I don't know what I don't know. Let me just pick another area I haven't focused on and do a what if. What if my scope goes down? Well, how would I fix that? What have I seen? And if you can't find one, what have other people had? Like, what have you personally seen in a match? Well, I watched a guy whose bag tore open mid-stage and it just goes down. Okay, so now I, I check my bag for tears and I'm making sure visually inspecting the prop and looking for any terrible items. And if I see a terrible item, I'm grabbing the one that I know isn't going to rip or it's my backup bag. So if it does rip, I don't care. Like, right. just really small details like that. Yeah, it's it's being in the moment, right? It's being yeah. intentional about every match, about every stage, about every shot, right? Yeah. And then you start to just, like you said, just just narrow it down. And if you can narrow it down to the to every trigger squeeze, everything else should fall in place. Yeah. And if it doesn't, that's okay. You work on the things that need improvement. Keep on trucking. So it's simple. It's Super real simple. easy. It's really okay, easy. got yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. No, and then well, I mean, oh, there's mindset. All right, let's go into how to see primers. Like, I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know. That mindset it, is the hardest thing. Um, I've always told people I can teach anybody how to shoot. You know, I'm an F class guy, right? I can teach anybody how to shoot 
anybody, you know, that wins, that wants to learn, that's willing to put in the time, a year or less, I can get them shooting with the top. Teaching somebody how to win, yeah, I can't put a timeline on that because that is hard. That is very hard. Yeah, it's it's very ethereal, um, especially when you have success early on. It can be, it can be really dangerous, from being honest. Mm. Early success, early in your career, to me was one of the most motivating factors, but also one of the most limiting because I felt like I was sort of only because going back to the Dunning Kruger, I thought I'm obviously good enough to win this one day match. Like, how much more do I need? I think I won like one, and then skip one, and then won like two or three more in a row. And this is my fourth or fifth match. I'm, there's 50, 70 guys that I'm beating, and I'm like, I don't yeah. even know what I'm doing. I'm beating these guys, so oh, this yeah. will be a cakewalk. <laughs> Fast forward, and it's not been that, but it's the the ability to recognize early success from hard work. It's really hard to put those two uh, with their appropriate amount of, uh, I guess, relevance. If I you know, I mean, there's a lot of one day trophies up there and stuff, but the the times that I felt like I shot my best and the times that I felt like I shot my worst doesn't equate to what's on the wall. It's the times that I felt like I followed a process, I executed well, and I knew I did the best that I could do, but I also learned something to get better the next time. And if I can achieve that at the end of a match, if I can say I had my game plan, I faltered once or twice, but I know exactly what I need to practice to assure that that falter is no longer a falter, but it's another working training point. That match was really successful. Uh, so you, you you said something there that when you feel you shot your best and you don't win, or when you feel like you shot your worst and you win, I don't think there's much difference between the two because you are surprised by the outcome with both scenarios. When, yeah, when you we don't win, control the outcome. Well, I know, but what I'm getting <laughs> at is some days you think, man, I shot my best and I lost. Right? Yeah. You're like, what am I doing wrong? And then when you go, man, I shot like crap and I won. Well, I must have not have good competition, right? The point is, it's it's hard to ground yourself and go, what what really happened here? You you almost yeah. get no feedback on your performance, right? Yeah. But when you That's follow a process, <coughs> then whether you win or lose, you have a score you know, that yeah, you give exactly. yourself. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the more important aspects of really just moving forward. It's not, at the end of a match. I'm hoping I have three, at least three major takeaways, regardless of how the outcome is. If I, I play, say, do what I want. The next match, quote, the match has already started. What Chad and I talk about a lot. Then the three things that I need to improve upon have to have come from that match. And I have to find something to get better at and go, where was my weakness? Get better at it. And if I haven't identified those, you know, midway, halfway through the match, a little past that, I usually find something early because I'm finding now it's not so much my late performance that's lacking. Uh, it's, you know, early performance, getting into gear at the right time. Uh, I want to find those three sort of work items early on so I can jot those down and be aware of them. So when I'm getting ready for the next match, I have a practice with a purpose type agenda and it's work on those three things. And I... I think this happened AG Cup. I mean, I I'm kind of a long story short. AG Cup was one of the best matches I have shot uh, through the first two days. Uh, it went really, really well. In fact, all three days went really, really well. But the year prior or years prior, I've always been fairly social on the clock or after the clock and in a match, you know, representing different brands and sponsors. Try to be more social. AG Cup was unique though that we didn't have to talk. To competitors and we actually weren't we're not supposed to or allowed to talk about the wind in any case or any of the stages props stuff like that so that sort of freed me took the burden off the shoulders i don't have to talk to anyone <laughs> this is like going back to my very first four five six matches where i didn't know anybody i had no expectations of me i had goals of my own but they were so far away that i just head down go to it go to work so to speak I got to do that at the K and M at the AG Cup at K and M for the first time in literally years. It, it was so liberating. I'm going to be honest. Not talking to people is not something I do well. However, listening to music and just being in sort of that like workout mode was incredible. I, I can't wait for the next one. Uh, and it, it actually learned. That's what I learned from the match. I learned 
I know I have different gears. I just haven't used that gear in such a long time. I need to start changing my transmission oil and, and get back into it, so to speak. So yeah, it's it's yeah, that's awesome, man. That sounds great. Um, wow, this went quick. Um, it did. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna have to do this again because we there's so much we didn't talk. We didn't even talk about your gear. We didn't even talk about any of that. This yeah. mental, this mental yeah. game is is so. And we didn't even get real deep into that uh, either. But I think this is gonna give a lot of people, a lot of new shooters and uh, seasoned shooters, a lot to think about. Uh, yeah. Because the mental game is is probably the hardest thing I've ever had to work on. And I'm still not 100% there, obviously, but I don't think you'll you'll ever get there. Uh, you know, like you, you guys are winning, uh, and you're now you're. I was talking to Chad, and he told me the same thing about he's trying to get into that flow state, and that's the next thing, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. uh, uh, it's there's always there's always something else, right? I've always right. the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know, right? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and and you know you're going into that that you know the flow state, and once you hopefully you get there, right? And then you realize this is just the beginning. Like you just who knows, right? But it's it's yeah. it's fun. It keeps it going, and uh, man, uh, happy 2022. I wish you a bunch of success, and uh, obviously Likewise. Chad's gonna be right there with you, and uh, and a lot of others. I mean, there's so many so many amazing shooters that that uh. I imagine their stories are not that much different than yours in the sense of you just got to put in the work. Yeah. You, you know, there's a lot of natural talent at the top, but there's a lot of shooters who are both talented and work like crazy. They wouldn't be where they are without a lot of dedication. Um, a guy like Dave Preston, who's, I mean, I think he's got 20 something, 25 wins. I've been doing this for, is it, I think 11 years? I mean, something like 2010, 11, 12, somewhere in that vicinity. And yet he still goes out. He spends two hours practicing off the deck, doing the same things that I did when I first started. He's still doing the same things 10 years later. That's yeah, that's pretty cool. So, I mean, it does take a lot of work. And uh, thank you for having me on. I look forward to hopefully doing it again. We can talk more about what you don't have to do to hit targets. Because <laughs> I think too many people pay too many attention to the wrong details of how they how they want to go win a PRS match. Uh, it's It's not really ammo. It's everything else. Yeah, there's so much. Back to the focus, right? They focus on the wrong things, and 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 it's yeah. it's all yeah. level of le there's only so much time, right? And it, it's the level in which you prioritize what's important, and oftentimes those are mixed around, and they're spending a bunch of time on things that don't matter, and the really important things they're kind of maybe down here. And because they yeah. think this is more important, they're spending most of the time here where they really need to spend it here. And going to matches and listening to people like you, then they start and, and just just pure experience will teach them, oh crap. If I just do this all of a sudden, bam. You know what I mean? I do, yeah. And it it takes some time, but I think everybody has the chance. They just have to find the, the way to get find a friend. I mean, in summary, right? It's Find a friend to help you be your own ladder so they can help you. They can pull you up. Make sure you train with a purpose. Find a very simple and effective training program. It doesn't have to be elaborate. It just has to be consistent. Uh, and then from there, reframe things into a positive. If you can take the word I can't, if you take the word hard out of your vocabulary and say it's a challenge, it's fun, I'm looking forward to it, and constantly be one step more positive, a lot of people are going to be a lot more successful. Oh, yeah. Uh all right, now you get to nominate somebody. Ooh, nominations. Um, I think a good one actually for you would be Ali Zane, in PRS anyway. I think Ali Zane would be a good one. She's the up-and-comer. I think you probably know of her. Yeah, I know. Um, she yeah, she would be a good one. I think she's had a really, really good year last year. She did really well at the AG Cup. Uh, I think I want to see where her career goes because her talent level, at her age with her talent, Dude, she was tearing she it up. You're putting hurting on people. Yeah, so. she was tearing it up. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I watch from afar, but I, I kind of keep an eye. And it's, uh, yeah, she shot really well. Yeah. So that Dave, have you had Dave on here as well or no? Who's that? Preston. Dave Preston. Not yet. I'm, 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 I'm making the runs with the PRS yeah, okay. guys. 
uh, or the PRS so. shooters. I shouldn't say guys because there's there's a lot yeah, of there's good there's women lot of that, that shoot well. Uh, but no, I'm making the rounds. But yeah, I'm, I'll have Dave. Uh, oh, I'm, I, I don't know if I'll I'll ask him. He's uh, he's a good guy. Uh, my first ever two day match. I was squatted with him, and I didn't know who he was. <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah. I was squatted with him. I was squatted with him, with Vivert, with Pinch, with uh, Paul Reed. And I just knew who Paul Reed was, but I didn't know anybody else. And I was just there. Kind of like you said, you just don't know who, who they are. And I'm just there shooting, you know. <laughs> yeah. And then later yeah. I found out who all these guys were. But uh, back to, uh, to uh, not knowing who anybody is, and I'm just watching, and I'm like, that guy's going really fast. That guy's going to time out. And I had it completely backwards just because, yep. you know, like, like they press and went <sighs> real quick though. Cause I know if we start talking about this, it's going to go on forever, but watching yeah, yeah. they press and <laughs> get on a barricade as a new shooter, it made me feel like crap because he's so <laughs> fast. And I'm like, so that's how you're supposed to do it. Why am I going so slow? And then of course it made me go faster and miss more you know i i had practiced my own rhythm and i knew i wasn't going to time out but then seeing him go i'm like oh i'm supposed to go faster he's so fast it's it's incredible yeah, yeah. and it's just smooth i mean that's yeah. one thing that dave is probably the og of smooth i mean between he and vibber i think those guys set a pace yeah. and a tone for new shooters willing to watch and listen and i know we'll, we'll be those those two set this new standard of how smooth is fast and it's incredibly fast when you watch them run a barricade uh, or when you watch them just transitioning from rock to rock to running a bull to moving their dope like it yeah that was where i mean that was where i started when my first my first two-day match dave was there i got to watch him shoot for a little bit and i remember thinking i have a new uh i have a new role model so let me go try to emulate that there you go all right man i appreciate this uh we need to do it again this was great definitely all right, man. Take care. Thank Peace. you. Thank you. Bye. -bye.